أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فاصبر لحكم ربك ولا تكن كصاحب الحوت إذ نادى وهو مكظوم لولا أن تداركه نعمة من ربه لنبذ بالعراء وهو مذموم فاشتباه ربه فجعله من الصالحين وإن يكاد الذين كفروا ليزلقونك بأبصارهم لما سمعوا الذكر ويقولون إنه لمجنون وما هو إلا ذكر للعالمين صدق الله العظيم دسورة استارت Surah Al-Qalam with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala glorifying or at least rejecting the blames Glorifying Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and rejecting the blames of the kuffar of Quraysh that they used to accuse Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with. Noon wal qalami wa ma yasturoon ma anta bi ni'mati rabbika bi majnoon. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about the greatness of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa innaka la ala khuluqin azim. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the result of disrespecting, dishonoring and rejecting Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And that was by mentioning the story of those brothers who inherited the garden from their father and did not want to spend anything out in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took everything back from them. The whole garden were, was burned down. After that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi in, in fact he advised the ummah to prepare to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. And the main way of preparing will be by fulfilling the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and refraining from disobeying Allah. And when it comes to the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the best way is the salah. And therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminded us that on the day of judgment, we will be tested through our salah. يَوْمَ يُكْشَفُ عَنْ سَاقِيٌ وَيُدْعَوْنَ إِلَى السُّجُودِ فَلَا يَسْتَطِيعُونَ That those who do not perform the prayer in this life, in this world, they won't be able to perform it in the hereafter. They won't be able to do the sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter. And as they won't be able to do the sajda in the hereafter, they will be separated from the rest of the ummah of Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And here we may understand the hadith where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us, Bainal Abdi wal kufri tarku salah. The hadiths have been narrated in many different words, which simply means that the only thing that holds the believers into iman is salah. فَمَنْ تَرَكَهَا فَقَدْ كَفَرْ The person who would, start, who, who would have a habit of neglecting the salah, who will not perform the salah, فَقَدْ kafar is out of Islam. <laughs> Although most of the scholars of Islam do not consider those people as kuffar, the person who will miss the salah, but nevertheless, 
we find from this ayah that on the day of judgment those people who do not perform the salah in this world will not be allowed to stand with the believers on the day of judgment. They will be separated from them. After all of that, now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, don't worry about what the kuffar have to say about you. Don't worry about what they have to do against you. Just ignore everything they have to say and they are doing. You are not responsible for it. They are opposing you, but in reality they are opposing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of that. This type of message is repeatedly mentioned in Quran al kareem Reminding Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that every person who's trying to oppose Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will not be hurting anyone but himself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would protect Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this continues in the ummah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us also that whenever you are doing the work for this deen, for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do not worry about anyone who has to say anything against you or doing anything against you. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam promises us in the hadith, لا تزال طائفة من أمتي منصورين there will always be a group of my ummah who will be receiving the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their sign will be qa'imina ala al-haq. They will be holding the truth. They will never let the truth go. Irrespective of what hardships they have to go through in this world, in this life. They will always be holding to the deen al-haq. And saving and preserving this deen the way it was taught by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam without accepting any changes into this deen. La yadurruhum man khazalahum. Therefore, whoever will oppose them will not be able to hurt them. But we have to understand or at this point that sometime it seems that people are able to hurt us. Remember, they might be able to hurt us when you look at it on the surface from the worldly point of view. But in reality, they are not able to hurt those people who are doing the service to this deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Take the simple example Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you look at his life, there were a lot of times when you can see the kuffar of Quraysh, they were really giving Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a very hard time. Imagine that when he's, Makkah, he's in Makkah, he's not able to invite people to Islam. And not only that, after some time, the situation was such that he is not even able to walk freely on the streets of his, own, of his own town. And as time passes by, and he left his town, he is not even allowed to enter his own town where his daughters are. His daughters were, were still in Mecca. His home is in Mecca. He left for Ta'if as he's coming back. They are not allowing him to enter into his own hometown. And then you go one step further. He arranged to enter in his town and go back to his home. And after some time we find that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or this was before that, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with the rest of his clan, they have been surrounded and secluded 
and in other words you can say imprisoned and that is called Sha'ba Abi Talib that there was a wali that was called the wali of Abu Talib where all the supporters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was imprisoned over there they were not allowed to leave that place and there was total sanction for three years total sanction on them for three years that no one is allowed to buy or sell anything to these people no trades are allowed with these people no outsider is allowed to get anything to these people you can't even send them gifts you can't help them you can't you cannot provide them with any of the necessities of the life not only that they were not even allowed to go and see them total sanction for three years and they would be hearing the cry of the children and laughing at those people that look at him the one who's promising paradises and he's promising paradise to every person who would believe in him they are starving to death and they are hearing the cries of the children and they're seeing people dying day and night starving to death and yet they do not open those doors for these people they are getting everything they want just there in the same neighborhood they are not far from them but they would be having food and every item in their meal and having all the comfort of the life and their own brothers and sisters because of helping Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are under the section sanction and no one is helping them and no one is allowed to help them and now when we use the word sanction I'm sure in your mind you might be able to link this with many other sanctions <coughs> and even today the same thing is getting repeated that they would hear the cry of the children and would still continue to bombard them and destroy them and kill them and the section sanction will continue <clears throat> it's nothing new it has a history behind it it has a history of over 1400 years these things are not getting done for the first time in the history it's a repetition of something that had already happened in the past anyway I was mentioning when you look at these points we feel that they were really able to hurt Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam look at the results we find that they were not able to do anything to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in spite of all of that power that they were using the kuffar of Quraysh were using yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to spread the deen of Allah and spread the deen of Islam and not only that all of those people are wiped out and forgotten about and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is still remembered with a lot of respect and remembered in every part and every corner of the world and throughout the history you would find the same thing is getting repeated a very simple example that we all can understand easily and may be able to recall also and therefore I would choose this one Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal rahimahullah when the government and what does government means not the non-muslim governments the Islamic Khilafah the government that was called Al Khilafah Al Islamiyah that same Khilafah started opposing the laws of this deen the same Khilafah started forcing people to believe in things that are totally against the fundamentals of Islam not only that they were asking them to reject some of the practices of Islam they were asking them to reject one of the main beliefs of our Islam and Deen and that is Al-Qur'an Kalamullah Qur'an is the word of Allah 
And is, as Allah is eternal. His words are eternal. They can never be destroyed. But those people were forcing people to say, Quran will be destroyed. Before the day of judgment, this Quran is going to be destroyed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to preserve it even for after death. <coughs> and if, until the day of judgment and even after that. <coughs> and most of the people to save their lives, they just said whatever they were asked to say. Although they did not change their faith and their iman. But at least they said whatever they were asked to say and many, of other, many others because of the salaries that were paid by the government. In those days, governments used to pay the salaries of most of the scholars of the Islam. They used to get paid from Baytul Mal. So they are not dependent on their communities around them. They are not dependent on the masjid. They are getting it from Baytul Mal. Because they were paid from Baytul Mal, most of them now, as they receive the order from the Khilafah, that you have to give a lecture in your khutbah, in the Jum'ah, you have to tell the people that Quran is not Kalamullah. Quran is created by Allah, is not the words of Allah. Just like Allah created the sun, moon, the stars, and everything else in the world, and He created as the human beings. He created something that's called Quran also, as everything has a specific time after which it will disappear and be destroyed. Same thing, Quran has the same method, and it will go through the same procedure. Those people who were getting paid from the Khilafah, they accepted it. But even during those days when people were getting paid from the Khilafah, there were some people, some scholars of Islam who rejected that payment. They did not accept any salary from the Khilafah. There were some others who were accepting it, but when the time came, they held fast to it, to their Iman, and they rejected everything and they said, we don't need anything from you, but we are not going to change the deen of Islam and the deen of Allah because, of you, because you people are paying us. <clears throat> but unfortunately we find that the large group of people, and not only just general public, even so-called scholars, they change their faith, Billah. And whether they believed it or not, at least they started calling for it in their Jum'ahs. They started giving lectures about it in the Jum'ahs that Quran is created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There were some people who held to it and they were killed. And now it was known that anyone who would say that Quran is not created by Allah, is Kalam Allah, he will be killed. So many people thought that if we will be killed, then no sense of standing for it. It's better just to say whatever they liked us to say, and then we will go back and do whatever we want. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that time, He blessed Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal rahimahullah with such an understanding, an iman and faith, that He said the maximum it will be that one more person would die. If they would kill me, it will be only one more person would die as there are thousands and millions of people dying throughout the world. What's wrong if one more person would die? And I'm not any special person amongst the Ummah. And I'm not better than all the other people. And I'm not better than Sahaba Ridwanullahi who sacrificed their lives for the deen of Allah. So what's wrong if I stand for it? And he stood for it. And he said, I cannot say it. They said, just say it once. Al-Quran makhluq That Quran is created, is not Kalamullah. He said, I cannot. They took him to the king. Ma'moon al-Rashid. And here, 
as we are talking about it, let me just also tell you who was Ma'mun al-Rashid. Ma'mun al-Rashid is the son of the great Khalifa of Islam, Harun al-Rashid. Harun al-Rashid was a person who loved knowledge, but he was not able to be on the peak of it. Therefore, and he used to see the greatest scholars of Islam, and he was always, we may be able to use the word jealous of them. And we them might be a better one, but really, if you look at it, in many cases, might be jealous of them. And therefore, he made his sons learn the knowledge of deen and become some of the best or one of the best scholars of the time. <coughs> Ma'mun al-Rashid, he had a, real, a lot of understanding of deen. Understanding means he acquired a lot of knowledge. His father got him the best scholars he could get at that time. Remember the word, he could get, is not that were available. The best scholars that he could get at the time to teach his children different sciences. And they really learned a lot. But you know what the problem was? There was a big problem over there. The problem was, Imam Malik rahmatullahi alayhi was there at the time. Harun al-Rashid approached Imam Malik that I would like you to teach my children the hadith because you are one of the greatest scholars of the world at, that, at this time. <coughs> Imam Malik rahimahullah said, if you want me to teach your children, you know where I hold my classes. That's in my home and in the masjid where uh, in my neighborhood. So if you like your children to learn Islam, then tell them to come to those classes. He says, can you please come to my home and teach my children? He says, I cannot. Can you please have a special session for them because I don't want them to just go and be sitting with the rest of the people. He said, then they cannot learn. If they want a special position at the time of learning deen and learning the deen of Allah, they cannot humble themselves. And the whole deen, the teaching of the deen, the starts with Abd, that you are the humble servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you cannot humble yourself for learning the deen of Allah and put yourself down to learn the Quran and the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then I cannot teach you. Sorry. Then you are not the person who deserves to be taught or who can acquire the proper knowledge of this deen. He tried his best. Imam Malik rahimahullah said, I cannot. I'm sorry. The only way is they have to come to the same class that everyone else attends. But he wanted someone who would go to his castle and teach his children separately. So of course they arranged for it. And he was, he's the king. He was, he managed to arrange for it. But he would not be then getting people like Imam Malik rahimahullah. He would not be getting people like Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal rahimahullah. He would not be getting people like Imam Bukhari rahimahullah. They would not walk to the house of the king to go and teach him, to teach his children some ahadith. They would say, our services are for all the Muslims. The time we have our schedule set. Those are the times that we teach people. You want to learn? Most welcome. You don't want to learn? Go and find someone else to teach you who would come to your home and teach you. But a person who would come home and teach, he also knows I'm going to teach because the king is paying me. And the king also knows that or the children who are learning, the students, they also know that he's, paying, he's getting paid by my father. 
In other words, they're looking down at the person. So all they need from him is the words that they can get from him. This is all they need, the knowledge, the words. But spiritually, can they benefit from this man? Never. They're looking down at him. He has no value in their eyes. Even the father has no value. Yeah, if you want to come, I can get another one. And if you look at the method of learning Islam today, this is exactly how we want to learn Islam today. That everyone wants to learn Islam sitting at his home. We want our children to learn Islam sitting in their homes. They won't go out to learn. Someone has to come over there to teach them. And once we repeat the same method, the same thing, history repeats itself. The same thing is getting repeated. That we are getting the words and the children are memorizing some surahs. Are they really benefiting spiritually to get what we are supposed to get from that person? No. <coughs> if Sahaba Ridwanullah would have asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that instead of having these general sessions in the masjid, why don't you come to our homes and come and teach us? That will be totally disrespectfulness to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as we all can understand it. So they would go to him, they would sit in front of him. Not only this, when the kuffar of Quraysh, they came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they said, Ya Rasulullah, we are willing to come and learn from you. We will decide of becoming Muslims later on. First thing, give us an opportunity to come and sit with you. Give us an opportunity to come and sit with you. If we won't sit with you, how are we going to learn from you? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted them to become Muslims. He was always looking forward, especially for those leaders of Quraysh to embrace Islam. Now at least they are coming down, a step down. So let me go a step towards their direction also. Okay, you want to come and sit with me? Fine. But we have a condition. The condition is that you have some of these poor people sitting around you. Ask these people to leave when we come. So give us a specific time that only we would be sitting with you. But we won't have those people. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam thought, what's wrong? These people who are around me, they are good students, they are good followers, they, are, they love me. If I would tell them to leave in those periods, they're not going to mind it. They would never mind it. They would obey. They would listen. As he was about to accept the offer, and he was leaning to it, Allah, subh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Send Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Saying, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, be careful. Wala tatrudil ladina yaduna rabbahum bil gadati wal ashi, yuriduna wajha. O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, do not force these people who are praising Allah day and night out of your gathering. They are looking for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot ask these people to leave. If those people are willing to come and learn Islam and sit with you, while these people are still there, they are most welcome. If they have any condition, tell them, we don't want to teach you. Subhanallah. That's the starting point. This is where we get to learn how we really need to learn. That's also something to learn. We need to learn from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam how to learn Islam. If we won't know how to learn Islam, then we won't really learn Islam. We have to know how to learn it. Nowadays, in the schools, universities, in all different departments of education, they are using different means and different technologies of conveying the message and transferring the message and making people understand. If these people have their method and their way of 
teaching people rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam also taught us what is the way of learning islam so i was saying ma'mun rashid had a lot of knowledge he memorized a lot of hadith in fact when it came to some debate sometime he had more knowledge than some of the greatest scholars of that time knowledge of quran hadith fiqh arabic language and other modern sciences at the time in fact he is the one who organized having books about different fields and all different sciences translated into the arabic language he had a department he is the one who of officially was the first khalifa first king in the history of islam who officially had assigned a department and uh, had a department who would be working only in translations trying to find books of all different sciences from different parts of the world and translate them into the arabic language with all of this knowledge we find that he is the person who became a cause for millions of people of the ummah to deviate from the right track and have changed their iman and changed their belief wallahi azza billah what was the reason same reason this is what i was trying to mention the whole thing for the reason was same he got people who can give him the words and he said with people that he can get the words from but what can be got from hearts what sahaba ridwanullah alayhi ajma'in got from the heart of rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and what they achieved by sitting in the gatherings of rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and they transferred that to next generations that was the thing that these people were missing <coughs> let me just spend a minute to ask ourselves a question then that what is it that sahaba ridwanullah alayhi ajma'in were getting from rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and they were benefiting by his gatherings if we think it was that if they have a question about salah they can go and clarify the question another question about zakat then let's go and ask rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam some other question about any other field of islam let's go and ask him that wasn't it they used to go and just sit in that gathering quietly without asking a single question and not only that in many of the occasions we find that they they're all sitting rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is sitting quietly he's doing his own tasbihat astaghfirullah 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 sahaba are counting he's saying it 100 times he said it 100 times he got up and went home they would get up and do whatever they have to do the whole gathering went by they are just sitting doing what just sitting around rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he keeps his head down and he is deciding something they are looking at his face and when he puts his when he left his gaze and he looks at them they put their heads down that's all going in that gathering as sahaba ridwanullah alaihi ajma'in say that sometimes we would see most of in, in most of the time in the gatherings of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he used to look at us all of us would look down as a respect to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam except for abu bakr and umar radiyallahu anhuma they would look at him and he would smile to them they would smile back to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so i was saying what is it that these people were gathering or getting from that gathering we know that now we understand it wasn't only questions there is something else more important than all of these questions that they are get, getting from there and that was what one of the sahaba ridwanullah alayhi ajma'in kept up front most of them were trying to be quiet about it because they do not want to talk of their feelings but one of them came up front and he talked about it and he gave us a hint at least if not exact understanding of what they were getting from there he says when we would be sitting in the gatherings of rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam our feelings used to be such that if we can see the jannah and jahannam with our own eyes that was our feeling that is not something hidden from us is not something away from us i can see the jannah i can see the jahannam and i can choose the direction whichever direction i would like to choose and pick for myself 
That was the feeling, that was the thing they were getting over there. And this is the nur, this is something that we call it the nur of Islam. We say Islam is a light. Light is not in these black inks that's on the papers that can be shredded. That nur of Islam cannot be shredded. The light comes from the hearts. That was the thing that Sahaba Ridwanullah got from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they passed it on to the next generations. And it comes passes from generations to generations. This is the nur of Islam. This is the practice of deen. And at this point, I have to also tell you, as a person who has been sitting at this place for almost 10 years and talking, I have to say this, that believe me, going throughout the course of learning the deen and learning the Islamic sciences, I did not benefit from learning the books as much I benefit as much as I benefit benefited from seeing the life of my teachers. From spending those moments with them, that gave me much more than what I got from books. The right understanding comes from there. Simple example. We all might read the hadith. There is a hadith in all the authentic books of a hadith. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was traveling. He said to one of the Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhi wa jma'een that I would teach you the most important surah of Quran and he taught him, taught him Qul a'uz bi falaq Qul a'uz bi nas. Then in Salatul Fajr Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recited Qul a'uz bi rabbil falaq and Qul a'uz bi rabbil nas. Done. We read it, mashallah. Now we have a knowledge of it. We had a great scholar. He was sick. And he asked one of his students to lead the salah, and the student felt that he's so sick today that he cannot stand for too long. He was old. He cannot stand for too long. So he recited, I think, in Salat al Fajr. After the salam, the scholar said to him, he said, if you would have recited Qul a'uzu bi rabbil falaq and Qul a'uzu bi rabbil nas, we would have got the reward of the following the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also. <coughs> we never think about it. Sometime you're in her, you want to recite the short surahs in Salat al-Fajr. We might just pick any surahs. He said, if you would have picked those surahs, you would get the reward of the sunnah also. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at least did it once or twice in his life. So these are the things that really comes only through that. Through seeing, through practicing, through being with those people. So I was saying this is something that he was missing. So he got the words now from those people. And as he loved the knowledge, and he had a great amount of knowledge also, and not only that, if a person will not be in the company of those type of people, gradually shaitan will tell him, you are, mashallah, a great person. You have so much knowledge. You studied so much. And this is the feeling he started having. There was a person who had a lot of knowledge at that time also. His name was Ibn Abi Dawood. <clears throat> that Ibn Abi Dawood was known that this person's beliefs are totally away from the Quran and the Sunnah. And all the scholars of Islam were against that person. There were many fatwas distributed against that person. His beliefs were all totally against the Islamic fundamentals. Mahmoud al-Rashid knew that this person, although that his aqaid are bad, wrong, but he knows he has a lot of different knowledge in different sciences. And even the knowledge of Quran and Hadith, he had deep knowledge, although the beliefs were a little different. So he chose that person to be with him all the time. People said to Mahmoud, that be careful, you know, you, this person's aqaid are totally wrong. He said, Alhamdulillah, my father taught me enough that nothing can mislead me now. And finally, Ibn Abi Dawood became the reason that Ma'mun al-Rashid was misled and he chose that aqidah wal billah, that Quran is makhluq, is created, is not a word of Allah. So 
So I was mentioning, and we went a little too far, I was mentioning about Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal rahimahullah, who at that time, in spite of seeing thousands of people getting killed, believe me, not hundreds, thousands of people will be getting killed because those people would say that Quran is the, is the word of Allah, is not makhluq. Imam Ahmad also said the same thing. Ma'mun al-Rashid, he knew that he is considered to be one of the greatest scholars of Islam, so he hated to kill Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, but he wanted him, wanted him to change his belief. So he, first thing he tried to explain to him, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal rahimahullah, had only one thing to say. إِتُونِي بِشَيْءٍ مِّن كِتَابِ اللَّهِ وَسُنَّةِ رَسُولِهِ حَتَّى أَقُولَ بِهِ Give me something from the Qur'an or Hadith that I can take it. If you would give me just one ayah or one Hadith, I would accept what you're saying. But if there is no Hadith, no ayah, then how I can accept what you're saying? And amaz amazingly, that a person is not asking for something that uh, outrageous or you can say something that is not to be asked for they're asking him to change his belief fine i'm willing to do it just give me one ayah or one hadith that's all i'm requiring you and i will change it i would go and preach it to the people but because of requiring that they started punishing imam Ahmad rahimahullah I don't want to go into those details now, that how did the punishment. But all I would like to say, that we can find out from this, that although it seems that they really gave him a hard time and they tortured him, they did everything they could, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used Imam Ahmad rahimahullah to save this faith and Iman, and the Iman of billions of Muslims, and Muslims to come till the day of judgment, because he held strongly to that Iman, and he did not, say what they were asking him to say. And this is why scholars have mentioned that there are two people who used their Iman and the strength of their faith and they said two words in these two different occasions. If it wasn't for those two people, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has his way of saving deen. But when you look at it from the practical point of view or historical point of view, you can say that it, if it wasn't because of those two people, today there was no Muslim, there would have been no Muslim in the world. Abu Bakr in Yawm al-Ridda. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, the day when people turned away from Islam after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and amongst the whole ummah, he was the only person to stand for it, and he said, we are going to fight these people who have turned away from Islam. Rest of the Sahaba opposed. He said, I, can, I, I won't care of what you people have to say. If I have to go by myself, I will do it. And then gradually they all realize his right. And Ahmad ibn Hanbal, yawm al -mihna. And Ahmad bin Hanbal, the time of hardship. When all of them were getting killed or going through hardships, when he held to this point, that, min kitab wa sunnati rasuli hatta aqula bi. Tell me something from Quran or the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, so that I can accept of what you people are asking me to do, to accept and to say. I remember out of many gatherings that we had about Hilal, and if we even stop now having more gatherings about it or meetings about it, but in one of the meetings. People were saying, what's wrong, you know, for the unity of the Ummah, just say it. So I said to those people, and they were all Imams, I said to them, that only thing I can recall and remember to tell you people at this time is what, is what Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal rahimahullah was saying, إِتُونِي بِشَيْءٍ مِّن كِتَابِ اللَّهِ وَسُنَّةِ رَسُولِهِ حَتَّى أَقُولَ بِهِ Give me an ayah of Qur'an or a sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa so I can accept what you're asking me to accept. No, no, why don't you accept? I said, this is not a hadith, this is not an eye. 
Makkah is there. Makkah is there. Fine. This is not a Quran. This is not a ayah. That's saying something. Hajj is there. I, I don't care. Hajj is there. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed Imam Muhammad rahimahullah. So I was mentioning, any person who would hold to the deen of Allah, although it looks like he's going through hardships and difficulties and not able to achieve his goals, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses those people's work. So this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. فَاصْبِرْ لِحُكْمِ Rabbik. O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wait patiently for the decision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَا تَكُنْ كَصَاحِبِ الْحُوتِ And do not be like the wealth companion, Yunus alayhi salatu wa salam. We all know it. Sayyidina Yunus alayhi salatu wa salam invited his people to the deen of Allah. وَأَرْسَلْنَاهُ إِلَىٰ مِئَةِ أَلْفٍ أَوْ يَزِيدُونَ he was sent to a nation that was, they had more than 100,000 people in that nation. They rejected him. Yunus alayhi salatu was salam got upset. He prayed against those people and the dua was accepted. But he made a mistake at that time. Remember, not a sin, a mistake. He made a mistake. And the mistake was the Prophet of Allah. Normally, the Prophets of Allah do not take any step in their life without getting the permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> Yunus alayhi salatu was salam, when he realized that dua is being accepted, and he was told that when you see certain signs, that simply means within three days of these signs, these people will be punished. He saw the signs. He left the town. He did not realize that he made a mistake. Mistake was, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him that these are the signs that after three days they will be getting a punishment, but these still, I did not tell you when to leave. So he was not asked to leave yet. So he left. When he left, he wanted to go away from the town and he was he wanted to cross the ocean found a ship that was going by they gave him a ride he was with them for some time and they were very impressed by Yunus alayhi salatu wassalam's behavior and his personality Yunus alayhi salat after some time they started having a lot of storms. According to their belief, they used to say that we have difficulty in the ship only when there is a servant who has been running away from his master. And he is in the ship. So they said there has to be someone in the ship who is a servant running away from his master, skipping from his master. Yunus alayhi salam at that time realized, oh, I left without having the permission from Allah. <laughs> so he said to those people, I'm that servant. They said, no, you can't be the servant. Finally, Yunus alayhi salatu was salam tried to convince them. And at the same time, that, uh, that, that said, we are going to vote on it. And they started throwing the papers whose name will come out. And whoever's name will come out, that will be the person who's running away from his master. And three times and each time, Yunus alayhi salam's name will come out. They threw him in the, in the ocean, a well swallowed him. Yunus alayhi salatu was salam was in the stomach of that well for some time. And finally, with the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the well spread him back out on the land. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. But we have to realize over at this point that we should never, some people made this mistake in their tafasir and used disrespectful words for Sayyidina Yunus alayhi salatu was salam. We cannot do that. <clears throat> this is a prophet of Allah. We do everything in our life without any istikharah. Those were the Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam. They were not allowed to take a single step without seeking his permission. 
And he did not know that at that time. He did not realize he's doing something wrong. It wasn't a sin. It wasn't that he was ordered not to leave and he left. Then it would be a sin. But he didn't know that I need a permission. He thought that signs of punishment are here and the punishment is coming within three days. Let me leave. What I'm going to do in this town now? As he left, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the punishment away from the people. Yunus alayhi salam came out on the land and after some time when he got cured, he was asked to go back to his people. Now invite them to Islam. He went and invited them to Islam. They all accepted Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us or reminding Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of that fact. That O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam take a lesson from that. Do not take any step in your life without having the permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَا تَكُنْ كَصَاحِبِ الْفُوتِ Do not be like the companion of that well. إِذْ نَادَى وَهُوَ مَكْزُومِ When he started crying Allah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and calling out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he felt stifled. And makzum means like chalked. A person who's chalked, he's not a, or a person who is not having the proper oxygen and having a lot of pain in his chest. That is makzum. And he was feeling like that because he realized that he left without getting the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لَوْلَا أَن تَدَارَكَهُ نِعْمَةٌ مِّن رَبِّهِ لَا نُبِذَ بِالْعَرَاءِ وَهُوَ مَزْمُومٌ If a favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had not reached him, he would have been cast down. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَا نُبِذَ بِالْعَرَاءِ We would have sent him out in the land while still he would have been blamed. <coughs> there are two different types of ayahs about Yunus alayhi salatu wasalam. One is this ayah that says, that if he would not have been blessed by Allah, he would have been blamed for the day of judgment, till the day of judgment. He would have been out. He would have been thrown out of the stomach of the well, but still be blamed. But the other ayah in Surah Al-Safat says, فَلَوْلَا أَنَّهُ كَانَ مِنَ الْمُسَبِّحِينَ لَرَبِثَ فِي بَطْنِهِ إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ يُبْعَثُونَ If he would not have been of those who would praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he would have remained in the stomach of the well till the day of judgment. One ayah says he would have remained in the stomach of the well. This ayah says he would have been put out, thrown out in the land while being blamed. What does this mean now? Remember, the ayah in Surah Al-Safat is saying that if Yunus alayhi salatu wasalam would not have been praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that praising was La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al If he would not have been saying those words, he would have remained in the stomach of the well till the day of judgment. But because of those words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved him from that position and got him out. But getting him out does not mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven, forgiven him for what he has done. <coughs> The forgiveness came because ni'matum mir rabbi. He still would have been blamed. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, No, I did not want him to have that blame till the day of judgment. So therefore, I blessed him and I told the world that I have blessed him, I have forgiven him, no one should say anything about him. And that is the reason we find a hadith Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, La tufaddiluni ala Yunus ibn Matta. Do not say that I am better than Yunus alayhi salatu wasalam. It does not mean that we cannot say Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the leader of all the Anbiya. This is a fact. This is in the Hadith and in Sahih al-Bukhari also. But the reason Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that so that we realize that we cannot say that Yunus alayhi salam made a mistake and this is why his status went down when Ayyazu Billah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says no. لَوْلَا أَن تَدَارَكَهُ نَعْمَةٌ مِّن رَبِّي If I would not have blessed him, then you can say that about him. But I blessed him and I forgive, I had forgiven his sin uh, or his mistake and I'm not hold him account, uh, holding him accountable for it. So who are you to say anything about him? فَاشْتَبَاهُ رَبُّهُ فَجَعَلَهُ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ Your Lord 
chose him and made him of the righteous servants wa in yakadu alladhina kafaru la yuzliquna ka bi absarihim lamma sami'u adh-dhikra wa yaquluna innahu lamajnun the disbelievers would almost make you slip with their eyes la yuzliquna ka bi absarihim rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is being informed by rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that oh muhammad these people the kafar they hate you so much because they are not able to do anything to you, they wish if they can do something by look, they wish if they have a power in their look, that if they look at someone, they can destroy the person by the look, they would destroy you by the look. They look at you in a way that as if they want to eat you up, they want to destroy you, they want to just get rid of you. So each look that they look at you is full of hatred. This is what layuz liqunaka bi absarihim. وَيَقُولُونَ إِنَّهُ لَمَّا سَمِعُ الذِّكْرِ Whenever they hear the reminder, so whenever they hear any ayahs of the Qur'an, they feel so badly against Rasulullah, so have, have so much hatred against them. He's the one who's saying this. And these ayahs are so strong that they cannot oppose them. I wish if just by, they look at him as, I can do something to this man. He's just bringing more and more ayahs. And this is what the ayah of Qur'an says, that, the more they listen to the ayahs of Al-Qur'an, the more their kufr increases. They're getting worse in their kufr because as they hear more, they're getting more and more upset and angry with Allah, with, with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Another beautiful ayah came and now they're again more upset. This is just like when you see a person who hates someone and that person, the person who's being headed, he always does something good. And now you go and tell this man, you know, that person is so good. He did this so good, mashallah. And he feels like, let me get, do something to this person. <laughs> now, next day you go and tell him, oh, he did this also. And mashallah, it was so great. And he feels even more bad about it. And you go on to the third day that he is doing even this. And now that person is just getting out of control. So this is exactly what the ayah is saying, that لَمَّا سَمِعُوا الذِّكْرُ As they hear more and more, they hear the ayahs of Al-Qur'an al kareem the more and more they are getting upset, and the, since they cannot do anything, just the look they give you is just as they are going to just kill you with the look. وَيَقُولُونَ إِنَّهُ لَمَجْنُونَ Imam Razi rahimahullah have narrated also a background of the ayah that there was a person in Arabia who was known to have a bad, a bad eye. And of course, this is a fact in Islam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam confirms it also that al-ayn haqqun, the bad eye affects people. When you look at someone and that person, you don't say, mashallah, uh, and you like something about the person, you really can hurt the person. So this bad eye can affect, is it, is, it has reality behind it and it affects people. It happened during the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that a person was taking shower, of course in those days when they used to take shower, they used to cover the bottom pad of the body and they will take the upper sheet out, they will be sitting by one of the wells and dropping the buckets on, their, on top of their bodies. So one Sahabi was taking shower in that manner, another Sahabi looked at him and he says, I have never seen such a beautiful body before this, such a handsome person in my life. And just as he said that and he left, the other person started getting sick. And he was so bad that they thought he's dying. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked them, what is the cause? I mean, how he all of a sudden started getting so bad? They said, the only thing we can remember, Ya Rasulullah, that this is what that person said, and I don't know what, what you would say about this bad ayah, Ya Rasulullah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, it's true. Let's treat him that in that way. And he treated uh, that person according to this disease, and that person was cured right away. So, there was a person in Arabia that... Used to, that was known, who was known to have a bad eye. When he would look at someone and say, great, that's it for that person. So the kuffar of Quraysh, they went to that person, and I think that might be the only time when you would see all the kuffar of Quraysh going to that person admiring Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And they admired Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa to that person so much because they wanted him to come to Medina and to Mecca and look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and give him a bad eye. So they went and told him all the good things about him. So this person wanted to see him. And they said to him, you know, we would like you to come and look at him, see him. So he came to Makkah Mukarramah. But of course, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa also had a hint about it. 
So he was always reciting the dua to protect himself against that. So that person would come and he would come and look at him, keep on looking at him, keep on looking at him, and they're all telling him, come on, do something about it. This is لَيُزْلِقُونَكَ بِأَبْصَارِهِمْ They're hoping to do something to slip you off with their eyes, to hurt you with their eyes. This is also one of the ways that they try to hurt Rasulullah, hurt Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And as a point for us to remember, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, whenever you, said in a hadith, whenever you see something that you like, say, MashaAllah, BarakAllah. One of these good words blessing Allah, the bless, that bring the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that the person won't be affected with a bad, bad eye. So this should be a habit. And this is something of protection from the bad eye. Then whenever we see something that we like, we say, MashaAllah. And they say, he's a madman. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, but this Quran is nothing other than a reminder for the mankind. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give all of us tawfiq to accept this reminder and benefit from the reminder. Hassan Bisri rahimahullah said, a person who is affected by the bad eye, if you recite this ayah, وَإِن يَكَادُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَيُزْلِقُونَكَ بِأَبْصَارِهِمْ لَمَّا سَمِعُوا الذِّكْرَ وَيَقُولُونَ إِنَّهُ لَمَجْنُونَ وَمَا هُوَ إِلَّا ذِكْرُ الْعَالَمِينَ Which means the last ayah of Surah Al-Qalam, if you recite it and you blow it on that person, inshallah it will help that person. And there are many other treatments for it also in the hadith. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين والمسلمات وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين